All right, Alan, I think we can go ahead and start. Good morning. Okay. Uh, we're, I'll, I'll start with an introduction. Um, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Alan Gelzo as our speaker today. Um, his topic is the joy of history. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's the author of a number of books, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the Redeemer President, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America, Lincoln and Douglas, The Debates That Defined America, and Fateful Lightning, A New History of the Civil War and Reconstruction, that in 2012. Um, his book on the Battle of Gettysburg, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, was a New York Times bestseller in 2013. Uh, Dr. Gelzo has produced uh, six lecture series for the teaching company on topics ranging from Mr. Lincoln to the American Revolution to most recently America's founding fathers. He served as a member of the National Council of the, for the Humanities and been designated as a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Dr. Gelzo's most recent book is Reconstruction, A Concise History uh, it's pressed, uh, published in 2018. His biography of Robert E. Lee is scheduled to be published in September. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Gelzo. All right. Well, thank you very much, George. I hope I have pushed all the right buttons that I am unmuted, videoed, and whatever else it takes to be hooked up and connected uh, to the great digital abyss <laughs> that we all have been populating over the last uh, year and a half. But virtual though this is, I'm glad to see a number of familiar faces and an even larger number of unfamiliar faces. So I get to reestablish connections, but I also get to make some new ones. Both are equally pleasurable experiences for me. George gave away the title. Well, of course, titles are there to be given away. The joy of history. <laughs> oh, at that point, everyone says, oh, what could that possibly be about? Because we're not supposed to find much joy in the study of history. Well, at least that's what Henry Ford believed. And his words on the subject have become legendary. History, he said, is more or less bunk. Well, a century later, and the common view of history doesn't seem to have improved all that much. In January of 2021, the San Francisco Unified School District moved to rename 44 of the schools in the district, including the ones named for Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, John Muir, Robert Louis Stevenson, Paul Revere, and even Dianne Feinstein. Now, when it was objected that the reasons for the name removals were often absurdities, uh, Paul Revere, for instance, was to be obliterated because he was connected to the Penobscot expedition during the American Revolution, which was supposedly directed at dispossessing the Penobscot Indians from their lands. Uh, when actually the Penobscot expedition didn't have anything to do with the Penobscot tribe. Uh, people asked why weren't historians brought in to review these renamings? Now, at that point, the head of the renamings task force uh, blew the objectors off with words that Henry Ford could have applauded. He said, what would be the point? Based on our criteria, it's a very straightforward conversation. And so no need to bring historians forward to say. They either pontificate and list a bunch of reasons why, or say they had great qualities, neither are necessary in this discussion. However, the volume of ridicule that this drew down on the head of the San Francisco District Board members uh, in fact, forced the renamers to retreat, at least for the moment. So history one, Henry Ford zero. It is naughty of me, I know, to, to take the unhallowed pleasure which that retreat afforded me. But the larger truth is that history education is not in a healthy state. 
it is one of the ironies of our time that more people are interested in history than ever before. Popular history magazines occupy whole sections of the magazine racks at Barnes and Noble. And while a proportion of that is either military history or sensationalism, it's still history. There are twice as many local historical societies in the United States as there were 50 years ago. History, nonfiction, outsells fiction titles. And producers clamber over one another to produce history programs and history documentaries. I mean, I'm signed up to participate in two new Lincoln documentaries over the next month. And it's not just in the United States either. The private foundation, Historic Canada, produces heritage minutes on Canadian history, which are so popular that according to the Canadian historian, Mar Margaret McMillan, uh, students often do school projects where they make their own minutes. And yet, there is a widespread unease that we are losing our grasp on our history and losing especially in the educational institutions where we assume it should be thriving. Starting with the passage of No Child Left Behind in 2001, the time allotted to any history instruction in American schools has been shrinking, sometimes to the vanishing point. Overall, in the first five years of NCLB, 71% of the nation's 15,000 school districts reduced the instructional time spent on history, music, and other subjects in order to double down on reading and math. By 2014, the national assessment of educational progress showed that only 18% of American eighth graders could be considered proficient for their level in American history. In 2018, a survey conducted by the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Foundation found that only 13% of those polled knew when the U.S. Constitution was written, and more than half, 60%, could not tell which countries the United States fought against in World War II. Similarly, since 2011, the numbers of history majors in American colleges and universities has declined by a staggering 33%. According to Benjamin Schmidt of Northwestern University, who analyzed this decline for the American Historical Association, students and their parents seem to be thinking a lot more that they need to major in something practical. And Schmidt added, history, humanities, English, and philosophy are not those practical majors. Now, I will be the first to admit that a degree in history will not guarantee an internship at Goldman Sachs. But the mental horizons of Goldman Sachs, I think, would suffer nothing but improvement from a historical perspective. However, even where history teaching is being taken seriously, a great deal of the seriousness dissolves in self-defeating directions. In some cases, history has faded into a kind of techno-narcissism, centering around various DNA tests, which will establish your ancestry, or at least the locus of your ancestors and presumably give your ego a gentle shove upwards. In other cases, history teaching has fallen prey to various forms of tribalism, by which, by which I mean the splintering of history teaching into the history of people's identity groups. In 2017, the Connecticut legislature adopted a bill which mandated the creation of a one credit course on Black and Latino history for the state's high schools. American history seemed to be a long catalog of kings, presidents, generals, a few industrialists, and a couple of investors, and that was it, complained the bill's sponsor, Edwin Vargas of Hartford. But racial, 
religious and ethnic groups, women, minorities, labor, unions, all these movements in America, they were lucky if they got one or two lines in one of our history books, complained Vargas. It was time, added another legislative member, Bobby Gibson of Bloomfield, to shift the focus in history teaching to many contributions which have been given to this country, to this state, by African Americans and by Latinos. Now, given that African Americans compose nearly 12% of Connecticut's population and Hispanic people over 15%, that's not an unreasonable demand. The difficulty lies in assuming that history should be taught piecemeal, race by race, or culture by culture. Since as, as one critic in the Connecticut legislature objected, there seems to be little reason why the state should mandate a course on one particular culture, and it's not mandated that we offer it about every other culture. Having a history is more important than having an identity. Yet, the Connecticut proposal is testimony to a diminishing confidence that the history of the United States can be understood as a synthetic national whole. We live in what my Princeton colleague, Daniel T. Rogers has called the age of fracture, in which, as Rogers wrote, shared traditions, values, and customs are defended only by, as he put it, conservative intellectuals who had not taken the libertarian turn, who still imagined society in organic terms. And the Connecticut scheme gives us fracture good and hard. What we see then is a broadening of historical interest, but at the same time, a shallowing of that interest. And it's not helped, I'm afraid, by the way that historical study is conducted even in American higher education. In the strictest terms, there never really was any such thing as history in American higher education until the end of the 19th century. The principal reason was that there were not that many history academics before 1925. History books were generally written by genteel literati. Cotton Mather on the founding of New England, David Ramsey and Mercy Otis Warren on the American Revolution, George Bancroft's History of the United States, William Hickling Prescott's History of the Conquest of Mexico, just some examples. Although the United States possessed an unusually large number of colleges in the 19th century, most of them were denominational affairs with small numbers of students, maybe 400 to 500, and small faculties, maybe 10 to 15. And they evinced little in the way of specialized study. As late as the 1880s, there were only 20 academic positions in American higher education that we could point out as historian. When the American Historical Association was organized in 1884 as the first professional historians organization, its charter members totaled little more than 200. And not all of them were really academics or had any pretense of being academics. Uh, they included, for instance, former President Rutherford B. Hayes. And until 1907, no president of the AHA was an academic. So up through the 1880s, history writing in America remained pretty much the preserve of those who could afford to do it on their own, uh, which meant for the most part, New England Brahmins like Francis Parkman and Henry Adams. All of that changed very quickly. History, as a subject to be studied for its own sake and taught as such by a college-based faculty working in original source materials and possessing some form of earned academic credential, came into its own in the latter half of the 19th century, beginning in Germany. Professional academic specialization of this sort made its first American beachhead, with the founding of the Johns Hopkins University. And by 1920, the American Historical Association had 2,500 members. Today, it's over 12,000. 
On the downside, however, the migration of historians to academe has often become a sort of monastic withdrawal from any realistic interaction with society. Nothing, in fact, so marks the writing of history in America in the first half of the 20th century as the determination to replace any view of history as an upwards and optimistic movement with various kinds of dreary historical apocalypticism. In just the same way that we might expect medieval monks to deplore the grubbiness and aimlessness of modern capitalist society. I have myself been a history teacher for all of my professional career, which will soon complete its fourth decade. In a real sense, though, I have been a historian, or if I can borrow a George Will-like term that he applied to baseball players as baseball persons, I have been a history person all my life, beginning on a sunny summer morning that I can remember quite well in the interval between first and second grade. I had not been an outstanding student in first grade. And to remedy my deficiency, Hi, Steve. my grandmother. Oh, hi. Uh, it's, it, it's your, your caller ID said, Steve. Did I lose a voice here? Did I mute something? No? OK, I'll go on. Go on. We're good. OK. I can remember very well, having not been that outstanding student in first grade, that my grandmother had acquired a set of readers that she intended to deploy as a kind of informal summer school to get me up to speed. Sitting in the enclosed front porch of her house, a story in one of these readers caught my attention. It was about King Robert of Sicily. Well, I went into the living room where my grandmother was always ensconced in a large velvet chair. What is this? I asked. That's history, she replied. I have been hooked ever since. So for me, writing and teaching and reading history has not been some form of prophylactic that I intend to pour down students' throats. It began as, and it has remained, a love story almost an instinct. Like an insurance adjuster who can never drive through a small town without having the appraisals of every building he drives past pop into his mind unbidden, I can never look at people, places, and things without wondering about the past that they came from. This is why I sometimes call history the second question. The first question is the one we ask whenever we encounter something new. And we say, what is that? But once we have examined these new things um, and tested their edibility on the dog, um, there is a second question, which comes almost naturally as the first one. Where did it come from? Did it arrive yesterday or the day before? Was it someplace else or has it always been there? Can anyone remember how it was delivered? Now, as soon as we begin asking this second question, we've really asked the basic question which underlies all the history which has ever been written. Not that history has always been answered by epic poetry. Uh, the answers that people have given have sometimes been very different. Sometimes the second question has been answered by the Iliad and the Odyssey. Sometimes it has been answered by creating annals and chronicles, uh, the kinds of lists that the ancient Egyptians and Hittites and Assyrians and Babylonians compiled when they began to vie for empire in the ancient Near East. It's not until we reach the golden age of Athens in the 5th century BC and the writing of Herodotus that we really arrive at something that we can call history. This is because Herodotus undertook to write the history of the Greek resistance to Persia as something more than mere, merely a listing of battles won and lost. He wanted people to understand why the Greeks and Persians were so different. 
And he located that difference in the passionate Greek desire to be left unmolested by others, by the Greeks' love of eleutheria, of freedom or liberty. The Persian invasions were more than merely a military incident for Herodotus. They were a clash of civilizations. So that injected two vital elements into Herodotus' task. He must research what the Greeks and Persians actually thought, and this inquiry he called historiace, and that's where we get our word history. And then he had to show how the difference in their thinking gave meaning to their conflict. So history, in answering that second question, must do two things. It must investigate, and it must seek after meaning in what it investigates. Of course, it's part of the human condition to disagree about meaning. St. Augustine had one view of the causes of the fall of Rome. Uh, Edward Gibbon had very much another. Johann Gottfried Herder thought that history was the product of blood and soil. Uh, his fellow German, Karl Marx, thought it was the product of the struggle of classes. They disagreed about history because they disagreed about meaning. And that disagreement is what keeps anyone from claiming to have written the last word about history. I did not intend to become a professional historian. Now, history was, for most of my early life, an interest rather than a career to which I aspired. My professional plans were for the ministry, and so I was never a history major in college and went to seminary rather than to a history graduate program. But the things in which I excelled in seminary were the church history courses. And when I graduated, I was offered an adjunct church history teaching position rather than a parish. And I was given encouragement to acquire graduate history credentials, which I did at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, not surprisingly, I wrote my PhD dissertation on a church-related subject. I wrote it on Jonathan Edwards's great 1754 treatise on freedom of the will. But in 1991, the professional ground shifted under me. I joined the history department at Eastern College as an American history professor. And 13 years later, and after two books on Abraham Lincoln, I made a second transition to Gettysburg College to take charge of the Civil War era studies program there. And then in 2019, I made my most interesting transition to becoming a senior research scholar in the Council of the Humanities at Princeton University. Over the span of these years, I have taught history subjects ranging from ancient Christendom to the rise of Harvard pragmatism. And never once did I think that I was wasting my time on bunk. And how could I have, when I consider what history does for the thoughtful individual? When history is done well and right, it becomes a useful instrument for disturbing easy conclusions. It reminds us, when we're tempted to reach for a solution that seems perfect and ideal, that the same or similar solutions have been tried before and with less than pleasant results. Now, I do not believe that it's the case that history repeats itself and that therefore we can easily expect other people to see that history is repeating itself and behave accordingly. I don't believe that you can say that anyone who attempts to do A will always get B as a result. Now, human experience is too varied and complicated for A ever to recur as A. So confidently warning and expecting that B is going to happen because of something we think looks like A is like expecting cherries to drop from orange trees because cherry trees and orange trees are both fruit trees. Democracies 
are not always tolerant, just as Athens was not tolerant of Socrates. Monarchies are not cruel, at least not always. History does not repeat itself. But, as Mark Twain is often said to have remarked, it does rhyme. You will not get oranges from cherry trees, but you will get fruit. At the same time, though, you will not get more than fruit. One great comfort from the study of history is that there are very rarely new things in human nature. Don't panic should be a primary lesson of any historical study. Another healthy instrument of good history is the lesson we learn from the sheer volume of it. In our effort to persuade people that historians have something to say, which people should hear, we like to organize history into patterns. And historians in democratic ages are particularly prone to inventing schemes of historical determinism, which encourage us to see both the past and the present as the result of inexorable and inevitable trends. Now, largely because, well, democracy is so messy and the multitude of human choices which democracy permits are not easy to account for. So we like to organize them into trends, but you know something, I have never yet met a trend. I have, on the other hand, met many people. And the variety of human experience should make us leery of attempts to squeeze history into a handful of easily manageable theoretical trends. As the venerable New Zealand historian J.G.A. Pocock wrote, history serves to warn the ruler on the one hand and the revolutionary on the other that there is always more going on than either can understand or control. History cannot be changed, but that does not mean that it was not changeable. And I have a healthy respect for the contingency and spontaneity of human events. If, if General Blucher had not reached the field of Waterloo, or if Charles Forbes had told John Wilkes Booth that he could not disturb Abraham Lincoln in the president's box at Ford's Theater, it's not difficult to imagine in what different worlds we would be living today. Perhaps history can do its best service by offering us moral models, examples of human behavior either to embrace or to avoid. <laughs> and the ironic truth is that both can sometimes inhabit the same human skin. At the very least, as Samuel Johnson once wrote, Whatever withdraws us from the power of our senses, whatever makes the past, the distant, or the future predominate over the present, advances us in the dignity of thinking beings. If, in the process, that thinking on examples of the good, the true, and the beautiful takes place, we will, if we do nothing else, make ourselves better people through our study of history. That man, Johnson added, is little to be envied whose patriotism would not gain force upon the plains of Marathon, or whose piety would not grow warmer among the ruins of Iona. So when the sky seems dark and faceless, we remember the testimony of Dietrich Bonhoeffer or the Lübeck martyrs, and we can again confide in faith. When we despair of the future, we remember Lincoln and Churchill, and we allow ourselves to hope again. Good history points us to how things should be. It holds up models of virtue, and it does not fear to be either magical or declamatory. But even in reflecting on characters who were not always brave or not always beautiful, we can still find that which holds off dissolution and despair. Plutarch found Alexander the Great a mixture of generosity and childish impulse. And yet, Alexander was still, for Plutarch, the soldier who praised Aristotle, who wished he was more like Diogenes, 
and who prized above all his copy of the Iliad on campaign. Plutarch Caesar, not Caesar, Cicero, Plutarch Cicero could be both statesmanlike and a political blowhard. But even at the end, Augustus Caesar, who had passed the death sentence on Cicero, could say to his grandnephew that Cicero was a learned man, my boy, a learned man and a lover of his country. But if these are ways to do history well, let's also admit that history can be done badly. It can be the product of poor craft and unreadable writing. Worse still, it can be perverted from the search for meaning in the past to the service of suspicion and conspiracy mongering in the present. The great Columbia University historian, Richard Hofstadter, once referred to a paranoid style in American politics. And he intended that as a, as a critique. But in truth, suspicion has never been an exclusive property of American politics. Suspicion, especially in stressful periods, is an all too human reaction because suspicion seeks the false comfort of knowing the hidden key, the magic decoder ring that reveals how the universe secretly operates. Suspicion works against history in particular because suspicion operates in flagrant disregard of falsifiability. It was, wrote Karl Popper years ago, years ago, decades ago, actually. It was the mark of real inquiry that real inquiry provided not merely the tools for self-confirmation, but also the tests for determining where it might be wrong. And that's what he called falsifiability. And that, after all, is what the scientific method is supposed to be about. Suspicion? Conspiracy theories? Those are about appeasing and inflating suspicion because they are purely self-reflexive. They reduce historical inquiry to the confection of mere narratives. They allow for no measure of contradiction or falsifiability. And above all, they're comfortable because conspiracy theories explain, or they purport to explain, everything. And anything which conflicts with them must be denounced with all the energy we usually expect to hear from conspiracy theorists who think that our skepticism about the grassy knoll or the protocols of the elders of Zion merely shows that we are in on the fix. Here is a home truth. We are suckers for history written around suspicion because we are habitually suckers for suspicion. After all, nothing shows how intelligent we are than to be able to write everyone else off as clowns and tramps. History is an art. That doesn't mean that it operates apart from falsifiability. What it does mean is that art, like art, history should be life affirming. We should be able to say without embarrassment that the American centuries have been one of the most remarkable epochs in, in human history. We should be able to draw the amazing contrast between the world that an American child in 1820 would have lived in, and believe me, that was a world that was still almost medieval. It was a world where households had to haul 50 gallons of water a day for washing, boiling and rinsing and burn 50 pounds of wood or coal per day through the winter just to stay alive. We should be able to draw that contrast between those times and our own and enjoy it. In 1880, not a single American house was wired for electricity, but 100% of them were by 1940 and 94% had piped in water and sewer. In 1870, Life expectancy at age 20 was about the same as it had been in 1750. And 37% of all deaths in 1900 were due to infectious diseases. 
By 1955, death from infectious diseases had shrunk to 5%. Electric streetcars and automobiles had transformed the urban and rural landscapes within 30 years of their introduction. You know, in 1900, all of the hard-surfaced roads in the United States would have gotten you no farther than from New York City to Boston. Today, the national highway system includes 160,000 miles of hard surface roadway. No history can ignore how easy our lives have been made compared to the lives of our great grandparents and grandparents. Now bear in mind that we have developed all of this sitting right beside Jim Crow, the limitation of the franchise to males, mostly white, the predations of the robber barons, and protections for free speech sufficiently feeble that a presidential candidate, Eugene Debs, was compelled to carry on his candidacy from jail. Finding meaning in history does not compel you to tell one story, which is all beaming with goodness and light, or to play constant games of beggar my neighbor by only telling another story full of misery and suffering. We do not, like the drunken man in the fable, need to fall off one side of the horse, remount, and then fall off the other side. We do not need to make the claim of perfection in how we teach and write our history. But we do need to reflect on the extraordinary capacity for renewal, which has made Americans what we are. Good history writing never lets us put out the sunlight. Instead, it finds side by side, generosity and courage and tragedy. And it never allows us to indulge meanness or contempt. I have tried to look for meaning in history because that's the only thing which makes historical inquiry more than, as I've said, mere narcissism or worse. History must avoid the entanglement of lethal meanings because there have been moments when the writing of history has been a worship of hatred and its aim not so much to rewrite as to blot out. That poses a hazard for more, though, than just history writing. For Americans in particular, it creates a challenge to the whole notion of civic order. Americans are a people bound by and identified by an allegiance to the principles of Republican democracy set forth in the Declaration and the Constitution. We hang together by what we attest to. The pillars of constitutionalism, the natural law that both empowers and constrains a democratic economy, the religion that builds unity and community in American public life, the equality that every citizen enjoys as a citizen. But if we allow ourselves to become indifferent to the history of that order, that civic order, then that will involve a system failure of civic education and citizen self-knowledge at every level. Or to put it more simply, if we do not tend to our history, the flame of our civil community will gutter out. In Steven Spielberg's film, Amistad, Spielberg puts into the mouth of John Quincy Adams, who is defending the Amistad rebels before the Supreme Court. This reminder, we understand now, we've been made to understand and to embrace the understanding that who we are is who we were. If we wish to imperil the American experiment, we can find few more sinister paths to that peril than by forgetting, obscuring, or demeaning who we were. For that will tell the story of who we are and who we will become. Well, let me thank you for 
listening very kindly to this, and I believe we can entertain questions. Yes, if anyone has a question, they can either send it through the chat to Alan, or they can unmute themselves and ask, raise their hand, unmute themselves and ask a question, please. Then follow up by muting. Um, Frank Tatnell, Professor Gelzo. Yes, Frank. Uh, having seen you interviewed on television many times, I've always associated you with the Civil War, especially with Gettysburg. Now I see you have a much broader view of history than just uh, 1861 to 1865. I wanted to ask you what you think about the term that's bandied about now, revisionist history, which uh, is, is one example now is an effort to uh, date the history of the United States from 1619, I think, when the first slaves. Uh, do you have a comment on that? Well, that's, uh, let's see, how many hours do we have uh, available? Uh, <laughs> I could probably keep us here to the evening news on that. Uh, but let me, uh, let, let me at least respond in, in a much more concise fashion. Uh, people often are worried about what they call revisionist history. And my response to it is, look, revisionist history is going on all the time. Uh, in a sense, revisionist history began as soon as Herodotus ink dried on his papyrus or whatever he was writing on. I'm not sure what that was. Uh, you might say that Thucydides is a revisionist version of Athens, or at least the Athens that Herodotus uh, thought it was. Every historian sits down, because every historian is an individual, every historian sits down and in a sense is a revisionist because every historian brings their own personal unique perspective to things. In many ways, I am a revisionist because for, uh, for instance, when I am writing about Abraham Lincoln, for instance, one of the major points I was trying to make in uh, Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, was the importance of seeing Lincoln in the overall context of 19th century philosophical currents of thought. Uh, that was something no one else had really ever done. And in that respect, what I was doing was doing revisionist history. I was revising our understanding of Abraham Lincoln. Now, the revising that I was hoping to do was revising with a view to expanding it, uh, deepening the context in which we understand Lincoln. But everybody, every historian who really uh, sets to the job of writing history is inevitably going to do a certain degree of revision. So I'm not really afraid of revisionist history. Everybody does that. Everybody has done it. And we've been doing it uh, for low these many centuries. And one of the great products of that revision is that there are, there are many times in which the revision turns up things that we had not expected before, gives us outlooks and perspectives we had not entertained before, and thus broadens uh, our understanding of individuals and events in the historical past. So I don't, I'm not pushing any, any panic buttons about revisionist history. If I did, I'd have to be the first one to turn myself in. Um, there are ways though of doing history well and doing history badly, as I said. Uh, there are people who have written history, which I consider to be just models for students uh, to take into themselves and copy. You know, there are great historians who've done things like that. Then there are people who have written very bad history, and I tell students to stay as far away from those as possible. And I would say that about any kind of artistic effort. As I say, history is an art. You can do it badly or you can do it well. Uh, there are examples of doing bad history, and I tell students to stay away from them the same way I would tell them to stay away from someone who can't really sing in tune. Uh, they're doing bad music. So you know, that, that particular history, not in tune, don't, don't give us copies of it. You mentioned as an example uh, the 1619 Project. I have been a pretty severe critic of the 1619 Project because I regard the 1619 Project as, on the one hand, 
being the product of some some good intentions, but we also know what road is paved with good intentions. The good intention is let us restore the story of African Americans to the overall context of American history. The place where that begins to veer off into doing bad history is, first of all, the people who've done it are journalists. Uh, they are not historians. They have not read the materials. They've not done the research. They're good at writing journalistic copy, and in some cases, sensationalistic journalistic copy. But they have not done good history. And in the case of the 1619 Project, I'll simply cite one example. The lead essay of the 1619 Project claims that the American Revolution was staged for the purpose of protecting and defending slavery in North America. The fear being that the British Empire was moving towards abolition and to prevent the British Empire from meddling with slavery in America, uh, the American revolutionaries took arms to protect slavery. That's the argument in the lead essay of the 1619 Project. It could not be more misguided. There is not a shred of evidence. There is not a statement. There is not a quotation. There is not a gesture on the part of any of the members of the Continental Congresses, the Continental Army, the Constitutional Convention that ever construed the effort to create an independent United States as an effort to protect slavery. First of all, the British Empire itself was not moving towards abolition. Uh, the British Empire does not, in fact, abolish slavery until 1833. Slavery continues to flourish, thank you, <laughs> in the British West Indies uh, in a way that, in fact, it, it never entirely took hold in the British North American colonies. Uh, if you really wanted to see a group of people who were deeply committed to the defense of slavery, it would be the slaveholders of the British West Indies, because that was where the real profits from slavery uh, were being generated for the British Empire. And in fact, if the American Revolution had been fought as a defense of slavery, the people who ought to have joined in most heartily in that effort and made common cause with the 13 colonies should have been the British West Indian colonies. In fact, they refused to have any part to do with the American Revolution the American Revolution is confined to the 13 North American colonies. So there's, there's really no evidence for this, but it's a great sensationalistic claim. And because it has the imprimatur of the New York Times, people will read this and they will assume that there has to be some credit to it. And this is one of the things that causes historians like myself to tear our hair out. And as you see, I have done that. Um, we... <laughs> we lose hair over things like, well, Columbus, uh, Columbus sailed westward because he wanted to prove that the earth was not flat. No, no, I'm sorry. That is a total invention. That is a myth. Nobody in Columbus's day believed that the earth was flat. I'm sorry. It, 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 it just wasn't anybody. Columbus was not trying to prove that the earth was round. Columbus was trying to prove that the Indies were a lot closer to Europe than many people thought. In other words, that the round earth was smaller than many people thought it was. That was the issue. But instead, Washington Irving cooks up this story in the early 19th century about Columbus uh, sailing to prove that the earth is, is not flat. Washington Irving, by the way, is the same one who gave us Rip Van Winkle. Uh, I, I have to deal a lot with a similar story. Uh, that is invented about Abraham Lincoln, that Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope while on the train to Gettysburg. And it's no, no, that did not happen. Abraham Lincoln had written out the Gettysburg Address entirely before he left Washington, D.C. The story that he wrote it on an envelope was first written in 1906 in a short story, a fictional short story by Mary Shipman Andrews. And it, it was a piece of fiction intended to make Lincoln's inspiration look so remarkable. Uh, 
but it was fiction. But it gets read in schoolroom after schoolroom after schoolroom and gets taken as being gospel truth. And I don't know how many times I have had to stop and say to people, no, 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 Lincoln did not write the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope. Well, this is the kind of, uh, of story making that when it's first invented seems entertaining, but when it takes on a life of its own, it creates a lifetime uh, labor for historians trying to correct it. And the same thing ha has happened with 1619. Again, it's a story like the Flat Earth and the Gettysburg Envelope, which, because it's in a newspaper and promoted by journalists, has uh, a sort of immediate credibility but it's a credibility which is not founded on anything substantial. So I suppose I'll be spending a great many uh, years in the future uh, dealing with exactly this same question about the 1619 Project and did the American Revolution, was it invented to protect slavery? And the answer is no, it was not. So that's, I hope that wasn't too long and belabored an answer, but it was a big question. No, thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh... Every time you say something, I learn a lot more about history. So thanks again. Well, good. That, that is what they expect me to do. So, <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Dr. Gelzo, Bruce Kirk. Um, Hello, Thank Bruce. you very much. Uh, curious, the history of the, uh, is it a cello or upright bass in the back, in your picture behind you? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not a cello. That's a double bass. Double bass. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> yes, I, I, I was and have been and still am um, a player of that very large uh, instrument. Being six feet four, you can't tell that from my sitting here on a Zoom screen. Um, it was the instrument which seemed when I was in school, uh, it was the instrument they thought I would do the best with. I was, I was the biggest kid in the class, so I got nominated to handle this biggest of musical instruments. And I've been with it, so to speak, ever since. Uh, so that's what's sitting behind me. That's, that's my double bass. And yes, I do actually get it out and play it uh, from time to time uh, when I'm not uh, doing other things. Everything mm -hmm. else that you see behind me is not a virtual background. That's, that's really books. Yeah, lots and lots of books. And there's more books on the other side of a <laughs> That's This is what historians live by books. We, that's our lifeblood, books and documents in archives. Uh, I often say to people, I can sniff an archive half a mile away. <laughs> Just the, the smell of old paper. Yeah, I can I can pretty well pretty well figure that. Professor Gillison, uh, Sharita Gillison, and Jeanette Scott Gillison, uh, educator for fifty years. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, I, just because you mentioned the sixteen nineteen project, I just have to say uh, the name uh, Carter G. Woodson. Yes. And uh, how he dedicated his life, well, scholar educator, and yes. he dedicated his life to correcting the historical records um, regarding blacks in the United States, and uh, he did that with the hope that whites would see the, uh, the uh, history and perhaps treat blacks differently. And then blacks, we would kind of sort of, of treat ourselves differently too, mm -hmm. once we knew. But uh, aside from that, um, how do people err on the wrong side of history um, is, is one uh, question. The second one is, I, I don't have any of your books, but I can't wait to put your book next to Doris Goodwin's um, Team of uh, Rivals. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, excellent. And had it not been for General Lee, dot, dot, dot. And All right, one that's... more thing, mom's a bucket list. She wants to get to the Gettysburg. We only have four hours. Where would you tell the Gillisons to Oh, I would, I would definitely, yeah. definitely go first to the Visitor Center. Visitor Center has wonderful displays, great movie narrated by Morgan Freeman. It has, uh, has a very nice uh, shop. And there you can get the services of what are called licensed battlefield guides wow. who will go in your car, in your car with okay. you, okay. and give you a tour of the battlefield. And you tell them how long you have, and they will... Uh, they will tailor the tour to your available time. Oh, 
Thank you. So that, I mean, that's one of the great resources. So uh, when you get to Gettysburg, make that beeline for the Gettysburg National Military Park Visitor Center we'll on Baltimore Pike. When you get to Gettysburg, you'll see signs you know, pointing you toward the, the visitor center. Um, if you miss a sign, just ask somebody in Gettysburg. Everybody in Gettysburg knows where the, the visitor center is, and they'll get you there, and you will just have the time of your life uh, at the visitor center and with a licensed battlefield guide, seeing that great battlefield of Gettysburg. And it's a wonderful place, wonderful battlefield to see. Beautifully kept, beautifully, beautifully managed. And my first book that from Professor Gelzo uh, to sit next to the team of rivals, which book should it be? That's like asking me which of my children is my favorite. That's not fair. Um, I would have to say Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President. Thank you. I would go with that. All right. And uh, the other, and thank you. Uh, well, let me, let me speak to Carter Woodson because I'm glad you yes. mentioned Carter, Carter Woodson. Uh, Carter Woodson dedicated a lifetime to Black history and raising the visibility of Black history. Carter Woodson gave us uh, the original, the, what was originally called the Journal of Negro History, which for years was the flagship quarterly for serious history and research on, on African American history. Um, in writing, as I have written about the Civil War and about Abraham Lincoln, I have been bound up with African, I mean, I wrote one of the other books that I wrote was about the Emancipation Proclamation and characters such as Frederick Douglass. Um, I, I mean, I can, I can go down a great list, but I'd, I'd be making footnotes and I always have to stop myself from doing footnotes uh, verbally. Henry Highland Garnett, um, Sojourner Truth, Oof. Harriet Tubman, you know, you go down the list. And these are, these are people that, whose writings I have dealt with, incorporated into the story. And one of the things you learn from this is how American we all are. Because what Frederick, when I read Frederick Douglass, and Douglass talks about his interactions with Abraham Lincoln. So here's a man who's born a slave on the Eastern shore of Maryland, all right? This is in 1818, flees slavery, he becomes a great abolitionist lecturer. He's probably the most famous and prominent African-American of his time. He's called to a meeting with Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States. Now, you can imagine a black man meeting with the president of the United States. This is like, oh my goodness. Now, curious thing is it was not the first time this had happened. Oh. In 1862, Lincoln called a delegation of African-American leaders from Washington, DC to the White House to consult with him. So he was already talking to black people. He actually lived in Springfield, Illinois in what today we would call a mixed neighborhood because in those days there weren't segregated neighborhoods. Everybody lived within walking distance of everybody else. You had to because there was, <laughs> there was no mass transit. <laughs> um, Lincoln, invites Frederick Douglass to the White House. And Douglass is, he's kind of at sixes and sevens about this. What kind of a reception he's going to get? Is this white man president gonna talk down to him? Is he going to insult him? Is he going to condescend to him? Is he gonna to try to manipulate him? Douglass goes into this meeting and afterwards he writes that Abraham Lincoln was the first important white man that he ever met who never made him think of color talked to Douglas, talked with Douglas, listened to Douglas. Now, that's the most important. I mean, wh white people in the 19th century are very great for talking to Black people, but not letting Black people talk to them. What Douglas thought was remarkable about Lincoln was that Lincoln would listen. And after Lincoln's assassination, Douglas delivered a eulogy of Lincoln at the Cooper Institute in New York City. This is the 1st of June, 1865. And in it, Douglas says, Abraham Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. And what a statement of ownership that was. It was, it was a statement 
that said, here is a struggle that we are both engaged in and we are both moving toward that struggle for freedom and equality. I remember Langston Hughes once wrote a poem where he talked about how the ride to equality was, was, was black people on white horses and white horses, white and white people on black horses riding together to the same goal. That was, that was Langston Hughes's dream. And in a sense, the history that I have been reading, writing and trying to write lo these many years is about that dream. Wow. My, people sometimes ask me, well, who, who were your ancestors? You're a historian, you should know your ancestors. Well, yeah, I do. There's my great grandfather up on the wall there. But I say in a larger sense, my ancestors as Americans are Washington and Madison and Lincoln. They are also Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. They are Ida Strauss and Ma Ingalls. And one of them who I think is the most precious of all and who I often refer to is William H. Carney. Now, my, my, my bet is that the name William H. Carney will not jump right out at you. All right, here's the story. William H. Carney was born in slavery in Norfolk, Virginia. His father was free. And his father bought the family's freedom and moved them all to New Bedford, Massachusetts. When the Civil War broke out, Kearney enlisted in the first all-Black regiment that, the Mass that Massachusetts created, the 54th Massachusetts. This is the regiment that was in the movie Glory, okay? Kearney enlists, rises to the rank of sergeant. In the famous attack against Fort Wagner in South Carolina, the one that's the climax of the movie, Kearney is carrying the United States flag for the regiment. He is wounded in the arm, the leg, the chest. When the attack fails, he retreats staggering, but he brings the flag with him, gets to the first aid station he can find. And just before he collapses, turns over the flag and says, the old flag never touched the ground, boys. Now, now think, think, only seven months before, see the Emancipation Proclamation it is law as of January 1st, 1863. Seven months before, William H. Carney didn't have a flag legally. He didn't have a country legally. He didn't have a citizenship legally. All that had changed. He appropriated it at once. He is my hero. So that's a long way of answering your question. You, you see, I'm in the habit of giving long answers. Please enjoy Gettysburg. I, you will have a wonderful time there. I'd like to make a, a, a very quick comment. I'm a 1969 alumnus of Springfield High School. And I remember coming back for a visit and seeing you as the drum major. Yes. And uh, yes. I also wanted to point out that there's a, a, a question in the chat that says, speaking of revisions to history, you spoke in a recent program on Grant. Could you comment on his rehabilitation from his prior reputation as the leader of a corrupt administration? And it means something to me because I'm reading, uh, is it Chernow's uh, biography? Yes, yes, Ron Chernow, yeah. Which I find very interesting. But well, it, it seems to be that Grant was a very ordinary person who really did achieve great things. Uh, first of all, let me salute a fellow Springfield High School alumnus. Um, so you were class of 69. I was two years behind you. Yeah, well, you were and, in my sister's class. Uh, I was? I was? Ginny, Ginny Hand, now Ginny oh, yeah. Ball. Yeah, I remember, I remember Ginny, yeah. And her brother, Robert. That's me. <laughs> Unbel oh my goodness. Oh, I can hardly believe this. This is, well, such a, such a small world. Yes. And yes, I was the drum major of the, I was the, the first drum major of the Springfield High School Band. Ah. So that's something I am 
irrationally proud of. <laughs> but all right, to, to your question about Ulysses Grant. Ulysses Grant is one of those presidents who has gotten a terribly, terribly bad reputation because the assumption is, and some of this is legendary, the assumption is A, Grant was a drunk. And people say, oh, he went all through the war. He was an alcoholic. Grant was an incompetent. He only wins in the Civil War because he's got more soldiers to feed into the butchering machine. And third, he is a disaster as a president because everybody in his administration is a crook uh, who is robbing, robbing the treasury without, without letter hindrance. And I will dispute all of those points and I'll dispute them the, this way. First of all, yes, Grant was an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic in the clinic sen clinical sense. And when we look at alcoholics today, we don't look upon them as moral lepers. We look upon them as people dealing with a physical deficiency and a serious physical problem. And Grant had that. Grant knew he had that weakness. Grant struggled to stay away from that. Uh, there were many times on campaign when at, in an officer's mess, everyone else is drinking pretty heavily. Grant turns his glass down to indicate he will not join. Uh -oh. the, moments, the moments when Grant will yield to temptation are the moments when he is away from his family, when he is isolated, when he is alone and depressed. And those are the moments when he will yield to it. And yes, there will be those moments. But under no circumstances do any of those moments affect his capacities as a general. He is a great general. He's one of the greatest generals in American history. He had that remarkable coup of the eye that could take in a landscape and understand all the military necessities that had to take place on it. There is a wonderful story. It's my favorite Grant story. After the, at the first day of the Battle of Shiloh in 1862. His army had been taken by surprise in its encampment at Shiloh Church. They'd spent the whole day trying to hold on, not to be run over by the Confederates who were attacking them. Darkness has come on. The rain is pouring down. Grant is sitting on an old stump with a dead cigar in his mouth. And his division commanders, one by one, are coming up to him and telling him, well, we're going to have to retreat. One of those division commanders is William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman comes up to Grant and something tells Sherman, uh, you don't want to say that to Grant. You don't, want to, you don't want to talk to Grant about retreat. So he said, instead he says to Grant, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? Yes, Grant says, yes. Lick him tomorrow, though. See, Grant had seen, he'd sized the situation up and realized the Confederates had expended their last energies getting just to where they were. All that was necessary was for the next day for Grant to lead the counterattack, which he does successfully. Uh, that, that is the kind of, of general that Grant was. He knew how to deploy his men. He knew how to deploy his resources. He knew how to make things happen. And no one moved with greater speed than Grant. Grant's, once Grant gets on the same side of the Mississippi as Vicksburg, his movements there are lightning. And when Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia evacuate Richmond on the 2nd of April, 1865, instead of marching into Richmond and having a big victory party and letting Lee and his army get loose, instead, Grant bounds after them like a panther. And in a week, runs the Confederates to the ground and compels their surrender. That's the kind of general Grant was. We're not, we're not talking about some, some hopeless drunk, and we're not talking about some incompetent either. The same thing is true about his presidency. Accusations about incompetence, accusations about fraud in his presidency were legion, but they came out of the Democratic opposition. I mean, he's a Republican president with, with very narrow Republican majorities in the House and the Senate. In fact, he'll lose that Republican majority in the House of Representatives after uh, the 1874 election. Um, 
he has he's in a very delicate political position and democrats are quite consciously using the committee process to question every one of his appointees to accuse them of things to hold hearings anything to make the grant administration look bad uh and having thrown a lot of mud against the wall a lot of that mud has stuck in people's minds but the fact is that of all the investigations and all the inquiries that were launched into uh, grants, uh, cabinet officers, and appointees. Only one was ever found guilty of malfeasance. Now, he was seriously guilty. He resigned before he could be dealt with. That was, uh, that was William Belknap. But of the others, the accusations were never proved. But because the accusations were made in such volume and with such persistence, uh, the, the legend has stuck that Grant somehow was this fumbling um, atrocity uh, as a president of the United States. And that is simply not true. If anything, Ulysses Grant was really our first civil rights president because it is Ulysses Grant who sends federal troops into South Carolina in 1871 to deal hands-on with the Ku Klux Klan and to suppress the Ku Klux Klan. And he is successful in suppressing and destroying the Ku Klux Klan in 1871. So Grant's record as president, uh, I think, needs rehabilitation. Uh, and what's more, I think we, have, we are seeing that rehabilitation because when you look at the polls that are taken every five years or so of the reputation of American presidents, Grant's is one of the few presidential reputations which has been on the ascendant over the last 50 years. And I think that move upwards is going to continue. I want to thank you, Alan, for, for you. We've well exceeded our time limit, and I want to thank you. That's my fault, I admit. Oh, well, no. You know, I, everyone that is held captive here, but we, we're, we're really expending your time, and we want to really thank you. And uh, part of that thank you is honorary membership in the Episcopal Church Club, uh, which we're going to offer you, and which I will contact you uh, shortly about. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and Nick? Yes. Darcy, would you, would you close us in prayer, please? Sure. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on the Episcopal Church Club of Philadelphia and the continued work we are doing to enlighten our membership and to do the work of Christ in this world. And this we ask through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Lord. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glasso. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Great job. Great, great, great fun. Great. Thank you so much, Alan. I've always loved your attention to detail. You left, Sade. Okay. <laughs> Bye, you He's all. He's gone. Okay. <laughs>